technologies, you may say mezzanine debt, you may say venture debt, you may say structured debt, all of that are just structures built around something where you continue to have an obligation to repay what you have taken. So there is a form of money where you don't have to give it back. It creates value, the ability of the manager to think big and kind of build on that, right? $33 billion of money was invested in the last calendar in private deals. $33 billion of private equity VC investment flowed into the country and equal of running are in the form and shape that will appeal to the people who are providers of capital, right? So this is one data point. The second data point is, there has been a substantial amount of what I call as financialization of savings, which has happened in the Indian market. A lot of wealth of Indians have started going into financial instruments and progressively from financial instruments, they will find their way into businesses. Historically, a lot of wealth was stuck in physical assets, be it land or gold or what have you. But today, increasingly, the current generation of savers are looking to save money in financial instruments. There are, the amount of assets and the management of the Indian mutual fund industry has grown about two and a half times in the last five years. And today it reads at 24 lakh crores. Right? So you see the amount of money that is available in the Indian mutual fund industry. Right? The Indian portfolio management industry, the portfolio managers, have something like 16 lakh crores under management. And the alternative investment fund industry, which is very, very nascent, which is about three or four years old, has about two or two and a half lakh odd crores of money under management. So the point is there is a lot of domestic money which is also getting channelized and trying to find its way into businesses. Because ultimately, they all have to get into productive businesses. They have to finance productive businesses. So the first point is there is money available. And the amount of money available, whether from external sources or domestic sources, has dramatically increased in the last about five, six, seven years. Right? So now, what are the forms in which money flows into businesses or particularly, let's talk of family businesses, because it's a family business conclave, right? The first form of capital is what we call as the three Fs. Family, friends, and fools, right? That is the first port of call, right? So he taps his, his own resources. He goes to his immediate family, extended family. Then he goes to his friends. And then he goes to some unsuspecting passerby who is ready to take a bet on him, right? And that guy also puts money not knowing what is going to happen because he knows him or there is some level of familiarity that you have. That is, that is where typically any business starts with capital, right? Then the second, and then he goes on to borrow it. Historically, you know, till 1991, the classic form of capital was promoter contribution of 33%. One is to two debt to equity, and the balance 67% coming from public issue. Because there was no other form of capital available, right? You either had to have the promoter capital or go public, list your stock, and then go out. So you saw, you know, 6,000 odd companies are listed in the Bombay Stock Exchange. A lot of them, you know, really are not of critical size because they got themselves listed prematurely. Progressively, as the economy liberalized and as external capital started flowing into the country, you also have, you had venture capital and private equity come in. So today as we speak, money is available at every point of the continuum. You have the entrepreneur's own capital, you have an angel invest, you have an incubator, you have an angel investor, you have a venture capitalist, you have early stage private equity, you have late stage private equity, you have pre-IPO, and then you have IPO. So at any point in that continuum, you have pools of capital which is available, which is looking for investment opportunity. Each one has its own set of characteristics in terms of the nature of money. And each one ha looks for certain things in the, invest in the companies in which they seek to invest. But the short point is I think capital is available. And this is not only with reference to equity. It is also with reference to debt. So you have banks. You have NBFCs, 
the amount of uh, loan uh, assets under management or the gross loan book credit of NBFCs today is somewhere around 23-24 lakh crores. Mr. Uh, Acharya will bear it out better, right? So that is the size that we have. The NBFC industry has grown. It serves to provide capital, aside from banks. Even within banks today, you have the small finance banks, which are tuned to providing debt to small businesses, medium-scale businesses. And within NBFCs, you have categories of NBFCs like SME financing NBFCs, which exclusively look at financing SMEs. So whether it is on the equity side or on the debt side, there are enough number of institutions who are today available. There are enough number of instruments that are available. You have something called venture debt, which comes along with venture capital coming from a venture capitalist. There is somebody who is ready to provide you debt. And that debt has to be serviced, even as you kind of, you know, create value for the venture capitalist. So the fundamental cardinal difference between equity and debt being an equity will flow to a business which exhibits the following characteristics. A, it fundamentally has to be value creating. It need not necessarily be cash flow generating, but it has to be value creating. It has to be high return on capital. Third, it has to be a non-linear, scalable business. If it exhibits some of these characteristics, then you will find capital flowing into those businesses. And each of them are very, very critical. You may not necessarily create cash flow, but you have to create value over a period of time. Because what an equity investor is looking for, he is looking for value. He wants to come in at point A, which is value here. He wants to get out at point B, which is at a different value, in a reasonable period of time. Right? So you, the business inherently should be able to create that value. Whereas for a debt guy, you should have cash flow. You should ha you sh people still have the overhang of an asset or a collateral against which they want to create a security. So you should have a security which is physical in nature, not necessarily intellectual in nature or not necessarily intangible in nature, against which something can be created and you should be able to have the cash flow that services that uh, lender on a continuous basis both for uh, principal as also interest. So that's, that's as far as the quantum of capital and the type of capital is concerned. Now, so what are the, some of the key considerations? First and foremost, which is very relevant for family businesses is, you should separate if you want to build a serious business and you're serious about it, you should separate your personal balance sheet from the family balance sheet. And that's the biggest problem that I have with most entrepreneurs and most family businesses. The personal balance sheet and the family, uh, the business balance sheet are so interconnected that they find it very, very difficult to separate, right? It's extremely difficult to be very sterile about looking at your personal stuff or your family stuff in one compartment and look at the business in a completely different compartment. Yes, there will be some connectivities because bankers still want you to give personal guarantees. Bankers still want you to mortgage assets. There are those connections. But aside from that, it has to be separated. The second is, your economic interest in the business should be limited only to the equity that you own and the salary that you draw. That brings me to the third point that you should not have any, ideally no related party transactions. But if you have, you don't have a choice, but you need to have related party transactions that they have to be at completely arm's length. Whether you are a lender or a borrower to your business, whether you are a tenant or a landlord to your business, or whether you are a supplier or a customer to your business. I think the problem that most family businesses have, and I will be reasonably you know, candid here, is that people mix up all of these things. And then go, on, go out and say, look, capital is not coming. If you have all of these mixed up in one kichdi, then an external investor is not going to derive comfort to be able to invest in you unless you separate some of these things and present to him a picture where each one is in a very, very sterilized and clean compartment. Right? That's extremely critical. The second is you need to draw a distinction between ownership and management. And this is all the more important when you transcend generations. And invariably, you know, if I were to be absolutely you know, blunt about it, Competence diminishes with passage of generations, right? And very, several family businesses have borne out to 
as examples for that, they don't survive beyond the third generation or the fourth generation. Simply because somebody is born with a silver spoon in his mouth, he grows to believe that there is a sense of entitlement. He is not as committed or as passionate about the man who started that business because the man had nothing and he had to do this to make a success out of it. Whereas the subsequent generations have the safety net of a lot of things for them and hence they grow comfortable in that safety net which in a way starts impacting competence, commitment, dedication, what have you, right? So there is a need to separate management from ownership. Yeah, you have to pass the ownership to the next generation. There is no doubt about it. But that doesn't mean that there is a sense of entitlement to succeed as managers. That, that, I think that distinction is extremely critical. The second is, even at the first generation level or at the second generation level, you need to separate the activities in the boardroom, the dining room, the hall, and the bedroom. You know, if you, if you start mixing up all of that, and you think that you can do what you do in one room in another room, then I think you're headed for disaster, right? And very clearly, the external investors or external lenders are not going to be comfortable in a paradigm where you see all of this getting mixed up. So you need to be reasonably clear that certain things have to be carried out in certain places and they have to be carried out only there. The third governance point is you have to be mentally prepared to be questioned if you want to take an external investor or a lender. There will be a 20, 25 something analyst from a private equity firm who will come and look into your eyes and question you on something that you have done for 25 years. That is the home truth and you have to be mentally prepared for it. If you have reservations around it, then you will find it that much more difficult to take some of these things, embrace and grow. You can still run your business. I'm not saying that you can still keep it a private, closely held business and run it for generations to come. There is absolutely no, no misgivings about it, right? It is possible. It is just that if you have to build scale, if you have to grow, if you want to create, then you have to be open about some of these things. I will just touch on two or three more things before I wind up. One, key factors for private equity. I will not talk about what a private equity guy looks for. I am trying to tell you what you need to look for. First, respect the fact that it's an extremely high-risk asset class which will seek extremely high returns. So don't go and tell him that I will give you 8, 9, 10%. He is looking for 25% compounded return over the investment horizon. Look back at your business and see whether you can generate 25% compounded return given the nature of your business. If you can't generate 25% compounded return, don't even have that conversation. You're going to have problems, right? Second, respect the fact that he needs an exit within a defined period of time. You may want to run this business, pass it on to your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and, you know, continue to keep running. He is not interested in any of that. He is very clear that in a three, five, seven-year period, he needs to get out. You can take him out either by taking your company public, by, you know, getting another investor to take him out, or by selling your business. You should be mentally prepared for all of these. And as they say, a private equity is a marriage with a divorce clause return in it. So you have to be very clear that at the end of that period, the guy needs to get out, right? So that's, that's extremely critical. And he is going to come and, you know, knock at your door for that. So there is no, there are no two ways about it, right? And the third critical thing is, he will seek rights. However much you may portray yourself to be Mahatma Gandhi, he will suspect that you are going to be doing something behind his back. He will want to protect himself contractually by seeking a set of rights, right? Those rights could be governance rights, those rights could be minority protection rights, those rights could be exit rights or a combination of all of these things, right? But the fact is he is going to be seeking rights because as a minority investor, particularly in a country like ours, it is extremely difficult to have his interests protected and it's not going to be easy. So he is going to be seeking rights. So before you go and reach out and try raising capital, be very clear in your mind. There is no point getting into it and then, you know, cribbing about it, saying that, look, you know, this is not working for me or these are challenges. You are better off being private, right? I mean, you are running a nice business, you are generating money, you can happily continue running it. Why get into this trouble? You know, you, you can remain where you are, right? The other thing about families and when you raise debt, is be very, very clear, particularly when you are 
multi-member families with two, three brothers or with two, three brothers with three, four, five children, please be very, very clear as to where the security and assets lie. Because particularly the way the country is going, if IBC takes its full form and shape in course of time, after we get over all the initial settling and teething issues, assets are going to be, you know, people are going to go behind it, right? At that time, you cannot have, uh, you know, you cannot be having public disputes about who owns what, right? So it is important that you ring fence some of these things and be very, very clear before you borrow and borrow with moderation. Because a lot of problems that we are seeing today in IBC is because of businesses that have gone and bond, borrowed beyond their what the businesses can support, right? Projects are not going to be easy to execute. They will take time, there will be delays. So please be mentally prepared and borrow with calibration and be clear about where the assets are going to lie and where cash flows are going to generate. And also be clear about what are the family's needs of cash flows, right? If you have four spendthrifts who are seeking for a holiday every quarter in your family, please be very clear about it, right? I'm not saying they should not have it, right? They are entitled to it, they can enjoy that. But be very, very clear that look for my, you know, the second son of my third brother, I need to write five crores per month because that is his lifestyle. Then you cannot go out and take on an obligation to service which is quite different from what that is, right? So I think you need to be very clear about both assets and very clear about cash flows at a family level. And the, the related point is economic value or cash flow gets generated out of what you do with assets and not by the assets themselves. Just because you are sitting in Mount Road and running a company which makes ball bearings, I am going to come and value you only on the profitability of the ball bearing business and not because you are sitting on Mount Road and there is a land value to it. right? There may be somebody else who is ready to lend on the land, but the fact is economic value and cash flow gets generated only out of the businesses that are being carried out using the pro assets that you have. It could be intellectual assets or it could be physical assets, but the bottom line is economic value has to get carried out. So that's about it. So ensure that you have alignment with all the stakeholders uh, uh, and both internal and external before you embark on any form of capital raising. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So, I told you, he'll make it elementary, <laughs> more than that. And he also told you he can raise some money for you, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think what came out from Ramki's presentation was, apart from equity, what you need to invest in your business is integrity. Today's lender, today's investor is a very well-informed investor, very well-informed lender. And, of course, IBC mentioned in passing, but that's, that's the biggest danger staring at any faltering company. But, so, anybody who lends money or anybody who invests equity in your company, he looks at your integrity. So, it's very essential that you function, you bring in a tremendous amount of integrity to your business when you get noticed by the market and then there will be investors and investors queuing up outside your office. I am very happy to invite Ms. Divi Datta, partner Shardul Amarchand Magaldas. She has come all the way from Bombay. Bombay is the financial capital of uh, Delhi. <laughs> so uh, I think she will bring a lot of insight uh, to this subject from her experience with dealing with the family-based companies in Mumbai with Divi Datta. Thank you, Mr. Acharya. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First, I think we, Mr. Ram, Mr. Ramki deserves a bigger round of applause. I don't think any of us could have explained the way he did in a much better way. And in a way, I'm glad then the topic I've chosen is not financing nascent family enterprises because I actually would have nothing to add. He's actually covered every point. So I thought that I should get some value addition because I'm a lawyer. So the topic that I've actually chosen, and I'm going to make it pictorial so you can actually see uh, what I'm going to talk about. 
I'm going to talk about a lawyer's perspective. How family-owned businesses are growing, how succession planning actually ties in with family-owned businesses, how important that is, and what is a lawyer's perspective on that. Now, the reason I chose this topic, well, there were two reasons. One is, of course, because I am a lawyer. I am I'm basically a partner in the private client practice of uh, Shardul Amarjan. The second is that because we work so closely with, with a lot of family-owned businesses, we actually have a perspective on what is their success mantra, what is it that actually makes them into such a successful business, and what are the challenges that we can actually see firsthand what they face. Like, from a public perspective, we just feel, oh, they're born with a silver spoon in their mouth, they have all the cash at their disposal, they have five crores and the generations, third brother, son, all of them travel. But what we don't see is the hard work that we, they put in. What we don't realize is what are the basic, most simplest and stupidest, if I may call it, challenges that they face. So actually, that's what I'm actually going to talk about. I think the financing part is done. So I think let's just, you know, talk about a bit legal as to, you know, what the challenges the family-owned businesses face and what is the succession planning that they're currently doing and what they need to do. Now, I think numbers is something we've all, we all know that India is accounts for the third highest number of you know, family-owned businesses after US and China. And also the fact that among top 30 family-owned businesses in Asia, India actually accounts for 50% of that. So I think that is something we know. Now, let's come to fundamental is what, what do we know as a layman, what is a family-owned business? It's actually simply these three words, family, ownership, and business. It's basically owned by the family through multitude of generations. They have ownership interests in that family, as well as management, control, and business acumen. This is essentially what makes a family-owned business. In most instances, management and strategy comes through generational experience. I mean, you obviously will see now younger generations are going abroad to study. They get in their own perspective. They try to get into new lines of business. So that is also a reason why you see a lot of family-owned businesses which have actually survived and sustained. Certain examples, as we all know, are Reliance, Tata, Sipla, Godrej. I mean, all of these are popular family-owned businesses. But I also want to add that when we say family-owned business, it does not only mean large conglomerates. You'll also see your local Kirana stores. You'll see your local grocery stores. They are also actually examples of very successful family-owned businesses. You will find that these even grocery stores are being run right from grandfather's generation to grandsons, great-grandsons. All of them will actually continue. And trust me, there is a great deal of success in them. It does not matter that it has to be a large organization spread internationally or nationally. All that matters is the ability to keep that business functioning and to keep that business growing, which in this day and age is extremely difficult. So we should actually appreciate, the next time we go to our local grocery store, we should actually appreciate the fact that yes, that is one successful family-owned business. Now this is what we feel. What has worked from them? Because we work closely with them, this is, from a lawyer's perspective, what we feel really works and what helps family-owned businesses to grow. One is elements of self-discipline. You'll be surprised. You may think that promoters just jet set all over the world. They have lavish lifestyles. But I should tell you, they actually sit in office or they actually work till 3 and 4 in the morning. For them, it's a passion. It's not a 9 to 5 job. We've had promoters who've left family weddings and flown back just to sign important documents. We've attended their family weddings to chase them to sign documents. But at the same time, I mean, what I'm just saying is that for them at any given point of time, if decisions have to be made, they're always available. It will never be like, this is past my office time, this is my bedtime, this is my holiday time, you won't find that. Another thing is self-governance. You'll be amazed at the amount of effort promoters and other family-owned business uh, individuals actually put in mental health, physical health, and emotional health. When I say mental health, that's also because mental health has become a huge let's say, a huge problem in this growing generation. But that is also something where you'll find every, most of these promoters we see get up at 4 in the morning, they'll do yoga, they'll go to the gym, there'll be a lot of emphasis on personal and mental health. Just so the fact that they can give their all to their business. Second, of course, something, this is actually a recent phenomenon, which is a good thing, is that promoters have now actually started giving up control. Initially, the mindset was really small, as Mr. Ramki also pointed out, that initially promoters were not willing to let investors come in. They were not willing to get, let investors get any amount of rights. But that is actually changing. Now you'll see that now promoters have actually adopted a broader mindset 
they are willing to let go of control they are willing to actually get in professional managers they are willing to advise them they are willing to get professional help to advise them how to make their business grow third is of course effective grooming of younger generations i am going to come to that in my next slide i am going to talk about a few success stories but yes this is most important i mean otherwise i know you i mean i don't know all of you all must have heard that age old saying the first generation sows the second generation grows and the third generation blows so yes i mean <laughs> that was something then but i mean i should tell you now when i come to the success stories there are actually success stories of third and fourth generations doing really really well and this is only because they've been groomed they've been given that opportunity to speak their mind they've been given that opportunity to get something fresh to the table of course another thing as i said allowing for planned induction of professionals into managerial positions also bringing new age values i don't know if if you all are aware at least this is something that the ambani siblings have started which is an open office policy they don't have doors to any of their cabins in fact none of the people in managerial positions have doors so it's actually an open office policy where an employee at any point of time can actually walk in can speak to them or an employee at any point of time can see what they're doing so this also somewhere builds trust this also somewhere effectively enables the entire organization to grow then of course younger family owned business in disruptive sectors now you'll find a lot of younger generations while retaining in the family but starting their own business this is also very important because there are certain family owned businesses which they started out only in a particular sector but then the younger generation under the family umbrella has actually diversified into disruptive sectors technology fashion interiors their own companies telecom so in fact that's also a very very successful model where the family owned business while it continues to be one business also lands up expanding thanks to the younger generation and their ideas and lastly and most importantly increased investment in research and development and development needs of business so initially i mean you just find promoters being very tight fisted not wanting to spend the mindset was really small people would think why would we need to spend on information technology why would why would we need to spend on social media but i think now everyone has realized the power of social media everyone has realized the importance of being on instagram the importance of being on twitter the importance of advertising in all of these uh, you know different platforms so i think promoters are gradually also realizing that they need to spend on r and d and information technology and that is also actually a very helpful factor in growing the business now let's talk about a few success stories i'm just going to uh, i've just obviously picked out a few i think which all of you all are familiar with one is of course isha ambani ananya bilra uh, anand piramal and kavin bharti mittal so let's talk about isha ambani i think all of you all are aware that jio is actually isha's brainchild and which i mean we know it's taken the entire telecom sector by storm i think almost 90% of us have at least one jio phone we may not have that as a primary phone but now because of the incentives that isha has actually thought about it's brought about a revolution my airtel guys are so scared they keep calling us please don't lose the contract we'll give you this for free but aap jio ke paas mat jana so i think mean, you can actually realize then that what a huge impact uh, jio has made of course second is hike i am not sure how many of you all are aware of hike but that is also a huge social media app that is actually very very popular uh, amongst generations third is ananya bilra billa i don't know if you all are aware of swatantra so ananya has basically started her own microfinance company where she actually helps rural women you know in, in basically getting money and now she wants to expand that and lastly is anand piramal anand piramal is interesting not only because he is married uh, isha ambani but it's interesting because at one point of time the piramals were never into the reality business it's only when anand came into the frame and anand started buying large parcels of land was when piramal actually got a reality arm so these success stories actually make you realize that it's really a good thing the third and fourth generation is actually growing and not blowing compared to popular belief now let's come to succession planning this was how we thought family owned businesses grow and what actually helps them i'm going to talk about succession planning and then lastly i'll talk about what are the challenges that we think they face now when i talk about succession planning and the reason why it's so important is because it's very important in this day and age to keep wealth within the family at every stage you must be hearing publicly i mean you know very very really like public disputes between families whether it's the ambani's recent example is of the singhanias 
where Dr. Vijaypat Singhania was actually thrown out of his house and you know there were disputes and all of that. So at this point of time, it's very, very important to do succession planning, also to ensure that your own family business remains in the family and it continues to grow. Otherwise, there is one dispute and look at Anil Ambani and look at Mukesh Ambani. I mean, what could have happened? What could have been such a successful business? It is successful by one brother, but the other brothers, of course, like really, really struggling. So we, I mean, a lot of family, uh, you know, promoters come to us, you know, that, you know, what can we do? Help us and, you know, give us models for succession planning that actually help us to move forward. Typical examples, of course, that the way we help them is, you know, succession planning through trusts, succession planning through wills, family settlements, family constitutions, or a combination of all of these. Now, these, none of these models, no one particular model is going to be the same. The same way that no particular family is the same. So sometimes we use a combination of these models. Sometimes we use a model that we think will suit a particular family problem. I'm just going to run through some of these models, just, just for a basic understanding. One is, of course, the most fundamental thing, I think, with every individual. Forget family-owned businesses. What every individual must do is make a will. I know the minute you broach the topic of a will to somebody, the initial reaction is, I'm not dying tomorrow. I have plenty of time to make a will. I'm, just, I'm, I'm still young. But I should tell you that I can actually tell you that because I have a will. And I'm very proud to say that even at this age, I have a will. I have ensured that my relatives have wills, my sisters, my brothers, everyone has a will. Okay, you have a will. That's good to know. In fact, I would suggest the minute you have any amount or even a small amount of asset that is in your personal name, you should have a will. Now, the reason why I say a will is so important. Firstly, of course, the good part is that a will can be... A will does not need to be stamped. It does not compulsorily need to be registered. A will can be on a plain piece, of pa plain piece of paper. It can be handwritten. The only thing that a will needs is that it needs to be witnessed by two people because the witnesses are the ones that prove a will. But to be honest, in, the, in this current day and age, just having a will does not work because now there are so many challenges. I mean, the, the richer the person is, the more greedy they become which is very surprising because you just feel that they already have so much money, what are they fighting about? But you'd be surprised, I mean, it's the, a, a will nowadays is in fact a very small part of succession planning and definitely not the most foolproof one. But of course, a will should definitely be in place just so that your legal heirs tomorrow are just not squabbling over your wealth and not concentrating on the business. Second is, of course, a trust. This, in fact, over the last couple of years has been one of our most successful family succession models. One reason for that is also because a lot of people have that fear of inheritance tax. The reason I'm talking about inheritance tax is because that is a problem that is actually plaguing family-owned businesses. It's not come in India yet, but, I mean, a lot of us anticipate it is going to come. I mean, the government has, in hushed tones, has talked about getting inheritance tax at some point. And if that comes, given that India has a lot of family-owned businesses, this is going to be a challenge. For those who don't know, inheritance tax is basically a tax that you need to pay on any amount of wealth that you inherit. So if your father or your uncle or anyone leaves you something through a will, the amount of wealth that you inherit through your father or your uncle, you have to pay a certain percentage of tax on the value of that property. Now, the reason why trusts are so popular is because typically inheritance tax does not cover trusts, or at least initially it did not cover trusts. I can't guarantee that the new law will not cover trusts. In the I mean, the, the government is smart. We all know that. And they already know the number of trusts that have already been set up in the last couple of years. But yes, at least for, and not only inheritance tax, but I think also for succession planning, a trust model works because it ensures that the second or the third generation does not erode the family asset. You can actually put in your flagship shares into a trust and have the beneficiaries to be your, uh, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, so that you ensure that while the benefits of that asset go through generations, the actual asset is untouchable. So that's actually one of the reasons why a trust model really works. And of course, another very important reason for having a trust is it, it eliminates the requirement of a probate. Now, again, I'll just explain quickly what a probate is. A probate is only mandatory in three states. It's mandatory in Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, and West Bengal. Now, any immovable property, if it's left through a will, you need to go and get a consent of the High Court to be able to get that property transferred in your name. You have to pay a huge amount of stamp duty, and it's a really rigorous process. 
So in your lifetime, if you actually transfer that property into a trust and eliminate the requirement of having it passed through a will, you actually in a way eliminate inheritance tax, you've got a succession plan in place where that asset can move through generations and you actually eliminate the requirement of a probate. So it is a win-win situation. Okay, now let's talk about family settlement agreements. I mean, you may have heard that term, but honestly, it's very surprising the number of family settlements that we're doing now. The good part is there are different kinds of family settlements. A lot of families still want to stay together, but they want the autonomy or the flexibility to be able to manage their line of business. They don't want that interference. So one aspect of family settlements that we do is that while ownership of the business remains within the family, it's just the different verticals that get management control. So that youngsters have the flexibility to run the business the way they want to, but at the same time, the business remains within the family. And of course, I mean, the other bitter part about a family settlement is a complete settlement, as you've seen the Amani brothers do, where there's a complete settlement of all assets, all businesses. I mean, effectively, it's just basically a complete segregation of business. But again, as I said, if you do a family settlement where the ownership remains within the, within the family, it's just management uh, separation that actually helps the family become closer. It actually helps the family realize that they need each other for support and that can actually be beneficial to enable the family business to grow. So we had done a recent family settlement of the Jindal brothers in Delhi, Mr. O.P. Jindal's uh, four uh, sons. So this is exactly the model that we had done because the brothers are really close. So it's not like, you know, they really wanted to settle. They didn't want to separate. But they, of course, wanted their own management control without interference. So while ownership remains within the family, each of the brothers are named as promoter and promoter group in the other's companies. But all brothers have their own segregated line of business. And you know where the Jindal brothers are now. Okay, let's keep Naveen Jindal aside for now. <laughs> but you know otherwise how well the Jindal brothers uh, are doing. So family settlements, of course, is also something we've seen a rise in. And the most interesting one, I would say, are family constitutions. This is something which was not popular two, three years ago. It was just being done one-off, but now has become very popular. So a family constitution is basically a document that governs the internal running amongst the family. When I say family constitution, it basically means that every important decision of a family is actually taken uh, between the members of the family. There may just be one person who's actually going to implement that decision legally. There'll be one person who'll be the director or the managing director. But every decision that that person takes will actually be well thought out by all the members of the family. And of course, the, the funny part is all, there are organized kitty parties for all the women of the family to also get together. There are organized vacations. I don't know about five crores, but yes, there are organized vacations, you know, where all members of the family actually go and, you know, uh, just spend some time. So family constitutions are actually very, very popular in this day and age because actually the internal governance uh, of the family is there. Every family member feels included. Every family member feels that their say is being taken into account. They have a power in the decision making. They don't feel that they're being sidelined. And at the same time, they, and they don't also feel that there is somebody doing all the work and there is somebody else taking away all the money. So in a way, family constitutions, I would say, are the next thing that will actually drive family-owned businesses. So family constitutions in this day and age are actually very important. Okay, now let's come to the last uh, part of my segment, which is basically the softer challenges, as I call it, is what we think uh, family-owned businesses face. And honestly, none of these are legal. These are just softer challenges that we've seen from experience. The first one, as you all know, is generational change, where there is a diverse viewpoint between older and younger generations. The older generations, of course, do not want to yield to the younger generations. The younger generations, fresh from their studies, want to get in fresh ideas into the business. And most of the time, there is a clash. So that is something where if the older generation realizes, and as you've seen the four success stories I pointed out, all of them, the younger generation was given a free hand to develop their own ideas and look at what they've made out of it. So definitely generational change is something that, that is one of the challenges. Second is, of course, family politics. When I say family politics, to an extent, I know you see some of that in serials, but honestly, most of it is actually true. It's, it's, it's not make-believe. I mean, I'm not joking when I say that just the fact that two wives don't get along and that can actually create a lot of family politics. We've actually had one wife telling us something in one year and somebody else coming and telling us something in this year, you know, when we're drafting documents. So that's when we realize that, you know, there is so much of family politics involved. 
there is very often you know the the very often the intention or very often the assumption that the person who is taking some money is not putting in all the work and the person who's putting in the work is not getting that much money it may or may not be true but very often than not yes most people feel that and which is why that leads to family politics third is professionalism this is actually also something uh, you know which which ramki also pointed out because promoters are so control driven and they are so control freaks they actually do not have the ability to attract external staff that is because visa vis members of the family who may not be that competent they will never give importance to external advisors it's always the members of the family who have that sense of entitlement it's always members of the family who will always be the ones who will naturally have that progression or members of or the younger generation who may not be that good but will always have that cabin or will always have that one position reserved for a family member so that is of course another challenge that we see fourth is again as ramki pointed out access to capital now promoters do not want to give any rights any investor who's putting in money will definitely want a board seat any investor who's putting in money will definitely want to have a say in how the company is running any investor who's putting in the money does not is not interested in your business he's interested in his money so promoters want that money but at the same time they don't want to give control they don't want anyone to have a say in their management so i think that is also a challenge it's a mindset challenge more than anything else and last of course challenges in terms of innovation i mean most of these organizations barring a few which are obviously usually successful they tend to be conservatively managed there will just be those one or two offices there will just be those one or two go to people who will manage everything they do not believe in expansion they just feel that if they expand it will just be too much and they will not be able to manage they just have, and a lot of promoters have a lot of trust issues there are just those one or two people they want to place their trust in and at, which is why it actually tends to be a hindrance in growth of the business so which is why, as i said uh, conservatively managed and last compliance with regulations this is actually proving to be a huge factor at least from a legal perspective i mean now you may be aware com the companies like the ministry of corporate affairs has levied huge compliances that need to be followed sebi rbi all of them have huge laundry list of compliances most of these family owned businesses because of their ability or because of their restriction towards getting in professional managers they actually most of them you will be surprised as to how non compliant they are every time any of these companies go for an ipo when when we do a diligence we actually realize that there is absolutely no sense of compliance ha ye to ho jayega aise hi to chalta hai isme kya hai ye kya filing karni hai i mean all of that you know they just they, they think is no big deal the money is coming in the business is going great what's compliance but what we are seeing now and what you'd also see the regulators are heavily coming down on companies which is leading to huge issues huge public trust issues the minute you see that a promoter is actually siphoning of money or the minute you feel that there are certain notices being issued to promoters certain glaring non compliances immediately the public loses trust and i mean as you're all aware there are growing examples now of promoters trying to siphon of money i'm so glad naresh goel was stopped on his way out but yes so this is also of course a big challenge that we see which is uh, compliance with regulations so yes so just as a conclusion key takeaways we just feel that there should not be a trade off between personal wealth and securing the interest of the family you can't secure your own growth without securing family growth the two have to go hand in hand if you want your personal growth you have to ensure that your family business grows and of course as i as as i said most of the challenges are financial there are certain soft factors and which is why you need to do effective succession planning you need to let go of control you need to broaden your mindset and lastly as i said it's very important to recognize that no two families are the same and no two issues are the same so i think it's very important for even families to realize that if a family had a issue and they dealt it with them in a particular way that same issue or that same solution does not apply to their family every family has a separate solution to look at and every family should actually go to professionals uh, for help so i think with that i conclude uh, my presentation thank you very much so okay uh i think uh, miss devi's presentation reinforced a fundamental aspect of lending as lenders you know we do look at we don't just look at liquid ratio current ratio uh, debt service coverage ratio 
we also see how organized an enterprise is to tackle different situations. Succession planning is one such uh, thing which gives a lot of uh, confidence to the lender or the investor. Similarly, uh, uh, the compliance issues. I was just telling Ramki when uh, my operations people, they need one business development officer, I ask 100 questions. But when they need one compliance officer, I ask minus 100 questions. <laughs> so that is how it's, uh, it's and earlier, compliance issues, if you tell a typical businessman you need to run your business like this, you say, if there is any compliance issue, I'll manage it. But now you know things have changed. Compliance is in focus. You are under uh, surveillance by more than one department. And I think at the end of the day, any business, what you want is not just dividend or return on investment, you need peace of mind. So compliance, a compliant organization gives that peace of mind. And I firmly believe that the, the organizations which believe in this, their employees do not leave with office in their mind. I have received only one question. I think the crowd must be having many questions so for Ms. Divi, but they must be wondering that there might be a bill at the end. But I think, I think she is here. You can make best use of, uh, she has provoked enough thoughts. So there is some time while I read out uh, the other question. Oh, now there is a question for you also. So I will give the questions to the respective panelists and I will ask them to answer. The questions can keep flowing. We have some time. Thank you. Yeah, the question is about uh, the depth in the debt markets and how reliable are ratings post ILFS. That's one part of the question. The second part is about how mature is the SME segment for listing in the stock exchange. Okay. The, uh, I think that we have been talking about the depth of the Indian debt market ever since I started working. And we have tried to bring in some depth into the Indian debt markets, but I think it's been moving in an extremely slow pace. I'm only inclined to believe, and this is my personal opinion, that we have come to a time in the evolution of the debt markets where I think because of the confluence of two or three things, one, increased amount of money getting channeled to financial instruments, as I was mentioning earlier. Second, increased use of technology platforms uh, to kind of facilitate trade. I think we are at an inflection point where the debt markets will start deepening sooner if not later. Because one of the things that happened in the equity markets, if you go back in time, is I think the equity markets suddenly assumed a different form and shape. The moment dematerialization happened and public outcry was replaced by online trading. So the moment you, with technology being available today, I think uh, there is a lot of scope for the debt markets to get uh, deepened. The second is about ILFS. I hope there is nobody from the rating agency sitting here. I think that is in for a serious overhaul. Uh, who is going to bell the cat is an issue. Is it going to be the government? Is it going to be public at large investors? I think that only time will say. But clearly this, uh, uh, this rater paying for rating model uh, and also at some level the companies paying for auditor model post the ILFS uh, uh, charge sheet by the SFIO. I think we are going to see some serious uh, changes there. What form and shape, we don't know, but it's always been an issue. Uh, and it's also to do with the amount of information that, while it is easy to blame, blame the rating agencies and so on, it's also a question of how information flows and, you know, the whole conflict of interest and how people manage conflict of interest at their end. But suffice it to say that it is going to change. Uh, SME exchange, uh, I mean, I'm personally not a big fan of the SME exchange uh, because uh, it probably doesn't have the rigor and the uh, intensity of scrutiny that the main board has. Uh, but well, it is a form of capital, uh, source of capital for uh, companies. So to that extent, it is there. In, in uh, my eyes, and I should qualify it by saying in my jaundiced or prejudiced eyes, 
I would tend to always suspect a company which goes and lists an SME exchange because the first question I will ask is why is a private equity investor not investing in that company, right? Because, uh, you know, there is greater transparency, greater governance, greater robustness in the business model if it goes through the private equity route. And why would somebody want to go and get himself listed prematurely and then go up the you know, learning curve of maturing into the main board over a period of time. But that's a very, very personal view. So, there is a market out there and as businessmen, if you're looking to raise capital and if uh, that can be underwritten, then I am sure you should try and explore it. Thank you. Uh, there is a question from Mr. Ram Chabria to Ms. Divi Dutta. So the question is, while the family wants to be together, how do you resolve stubborn differences within the family? So honestly, this also depends on the kind of differences that you have. Couple of instances of stubborn differences that we have seen is of course the younger generations want to opt out of the family business because they think it's something which they don't want to do and they want to start their own. So I think, as I've said, one way to resolve that difference is you do give them an amount of seed capital and have them try and branch out into the kind of business they want to do, while at the same time being under the family brand or the family umbrella. Second stubborn difference, of course, can happen between two members who are running the same business. As I said, one may feel that, you know, the other one is putting in more effort. And, you know, one may feel that, you know, while I'm putting in more effort, the other one is making more money. But I think that also, as I said, there should be a clear demarcation of responsibilities that, you know, you handle this aspect of the business, I handle that aspect of the business. One way to manage that would be is that what you make is what you take. So, as I said, there are differences, I mean, it depends on the set of problems. Another, and lastly, I mean, if differences cannot be resolved at any cost, then maybe, yes, you can go for a family settlement, but you can go to a settlement where you remain together, you have ownership in each other's business uh, models or business vehicles, but at the same time, you give each other enough flexibility to run your own business and not feel, you know, that the other person is interfering or the other person is doing less, and that will also prevent uh, ego clashes. I mean, if Mr. Chabria can elaborate what kind of differences, maybe I can give you a better answer, but differences can actually be many. So it will really depend on, you know, what kind of difference, because honestly, no two family issues would be the same. There's a question from my senior friend, Sam, Mr. S.A. Murli Prasad, to Ramki. question is about uh, seeking my comments on the recent issues about pledging of promoter shares and uh, which way the promoter should go. Uh, sir, I think essentially most of these pledge situations have been because the promoters have one business which probably is doing well and is reflecting in, reflected in the stock price of that particular company. And they have at some level got themselves into other businesses which don't seem to be promising the kind of value creation or cash flow as the principal business is kind of focused on or is able to generate. So they have tried to use the value generation potential of their principal business by going and pledging with mutual funds and try to fund the money that they are raising as equity for their other businesses. I think this is the broad structure which seems to have played out in most of these cases. And unfortunately, what has happened is when there is a meltdown in the stock price of the principal business, the uh, pledge gets invoked. And because you don't have the cash flows to kind of support that, the invocation of the pledge, you let the pledge kind of get invoked and the stock, the moment the guy who invokes the pledge starts selling, the stock further starts coming down because they are fundamentally, there's only a certain amount of liquidity that the market can absorb. So, I think the issue here is one of, uh, I think, imprudent financial planning because they really did not see the eventuality that the pledge will get invoked and they did not have the cash flows to support an invocation. The borrower will have the necessary liquidity to be able to close out the borrowing that he has taken. God forbid if the event doesn't materialize as planned at the time of lending, then he gets himself into some kind of a difficulty. And I think some of these are even based lending. It is likely that the borrower would have gone and told the investor that, look, I am going to raise private equity or I am going to raise private capital in my other business. And the moment private capital is raised, 
I will be able to kind of, you know, foreclose this. That not having happened because the businesses have not matured, I think is putting them in a spot. Because it's all learnings that we are going through and uh, I hope with every learning and every episode we come out wiser and uh, better. This used to be called bridge loans those Correct. days. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have come to the close of this program. I thank my fellow panelists for giving a very powerful and uh, sharing their insight uh, with the people. Thank you so much. I request the chairman of the session, Mr. Srinivas Acharya, to kindly present mementos. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before you leave, a couple of announcements. Uh, we have uh, lined up very interesting post-lunch uh, sessions. A special session three will be on ensuring family legacy, multiple family offices, wherein we have Mr. Pramod Kumar of IIFL Wealth Advisors India Private Limited, Mr. Suresh Ramanujam and Krish Srikanth, who will be the distinguished speakers. And we also have a very interesting panel discussion on winning strategies for family business, uh, wherein we have uh, Mr. Ishad Ahmed of uh, Managing Director of Farida Group, Mr. Krishna Chaitanya, partner Ernest Young, Ms. Archana Das, Head Ascent, who's come all the way from Mumbai. Uh, they will be sharing their uh, thoughts on winning strategies for family business. So these are the two interesting topics post-lunch. We will now break for lunch and reassemble for the post-lunch session at 2.15. We've organized a great lunch for you. Please join us for lunch. Thank you very much.